Okay, welcome to Chapter 2 Lecture for Ethics. Uh, this is going to talk about uh, professional and developmental ethics. Uh, in the previous lecture, I, I told you about the levels uh, of professional development, and these are the four levels of professional development. Uh, there are Level 1, which is students in the school who complete coursework, uh, who rely upon, upon their education. Um, and they are dependent upon supervisors. Um, there is um, anxiety about new experiences and then limited self-awareness. Level two, advanced students uh, may be on to internship, uh, facilitate between confusion and independence, uh, and um, will be taking the first steps towards um, uh, independent professionalism. Uh, level three is complete training, but uh, not paralyzed by doubt, deeper thinking, um, and this would be whenever the uh, internship is done and you're an early professional. And then later, level four is integrate theory and practice, where things become so cohesive that the person is actively uh, using ethics and then also giving back by helping to train the next level of counselors. Uh, on the ethical side, level one is eager to learn codes, the letter of the law, um, uh, lots of risk management and consultation. Level two views laws as guidelines, committed to ethics, uh, supervision versus autonomy. Uh, still uh, under the wing or guidance of some type of mentor under the realm of supervision. Level three, bigger perspective, integrate professionalism, values, and context. Uh, this is going to be where um, the professional takes on a larger role in their individual ethical decision making. Uh, and then also on level four, high integration, expertise, uh, able to navigate through dilemmas, good balance with consultation, <laughs> and decision-making. Uh, there's a summary of this on page 24 in the uh, in the textbook. Um, here's where we're going to go for the rest of this uh, slideshow today. We're going to talk about these seven areas uh, and this is going to be the basis and foundation uh, for your first test. It's going to be really be taken from these seven areas here. Uh, first we have autonomy. Autonomy is the right of self-determination for clients and self-direction. Uh, it's the freedom of choice uh, that the clients deserve and their respect and it's the clients rights to have and the counselors ideals should be to enforce and enhance the happening of this uh, therefore to deny patients right is unethical some examples is uh, the inpatient rehab where someone is uh, uh, maybe uh, admitted against their will to do treatment uh, interventions uh, where a person may not know what the uh, course of action is going to be and then we're going to talk about and we're actually going to read through St. Agnes story in class. Uh, thought discussion, what if you're a substance abuse counselor for alcohol and the patient mentions that they abuse man marijuana mar recreationally? Um, how do you use that as far as allowing the client to maintain autonomy within the group session and not exploiting something that they've said uh, in that moment? Uh, next is uh, benevolence, uh, which is the obligation to uh, good to others, to do good to others and help others. Um, kind of like the golden rule. Um, understand your own competencies, uh, the basics of the golden rule. Examples, calling people back, doing what you say you're going to do, etc. Making sure that you follow through in, in areas and things that you uh, are um, needing to follow through on. Um, next is non-malfeasance, which is do no harm. It's the most fundamental value. Um, avoid and prevent harm to patients and clients. Um, as some questions, uh, some things to keep in mind about this is uh, be mindful if you have a vulnerable population like victims of domestic violence or even adolescents. Uh, do you know what is best? Uh, oftentimes um, it can be very directive and intrusive for us to project what we feel like a client uh, should be doing onto them uh, just because it's in a treatment model and oftentimes that's not what's best for the client. Some examples would be harsh words, confrontation or apathy practices that are harmful. Um, signs on clients can be seen as stigmas or labels as well as uh, the more serious or blatant acts where there's extreme confrontation. Um, there are standards of care that we can follow if we follow the standard of care 
um, then in many cases we will um, be closer to the line of do no harm. Next is justice. Justice is fairness, equality in treatment and access to treatment, avoid discrimination and service provision. Um, chronicle article, we're going to read about Katrina victims. Also, um, we'll look at a case study with the psych tech and ARAB patients, and then substance abuse and treatment of abusers um, as far as um, those who uh, subscribe to the disease model of addiction would say that uh, those who have uh, minor possession charges and are not actively caught with intent to distribute or more uh, criminal type cases that they should always be given the fairness of treatment and treatment alternatives to incarceration uh, is um, taking uh, weight in our society today. Fidelity is honesty, loyalty, and keeping commitments. Um, the little things go far as far as um, just uh, being fair with clients, letting clients know what the expectations are. Um, bad habits of omission catch up as far as um, <clears throat> making sure that um, clients can trust you, that you're honest, that if you have an appointment scheduled at a time that you uh, if you have to reschedule that appointment, make sure you do so on enough time. There's just a lot of things that go along with um, being on level with trust and therapy. Clients begin to figure you out, um, and then uh, you know you look at uh, one of the questions I'm going to ask in class this week is: Should you lie to your clients or patients for their sake? For their sake, in other words, if a client's in rehab and a client finds out that, uh, or or you as the counselor find out that the client's uh, grandparent or even mother or father um, has passed um, and the client is in a critical state of uh, pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation um, and uh, to do so, to tell this client about this death would uh, cause treatment to digress. That's a really, um, that's a really important question to look at and some things that you need to start to think through as you prepare for being in the field. Uh, next is integrity. Um, integrity is promoting accuracy, honesty, and truthfulness in practice. Um, and you should uh, allow clients to know that things like stealing, lying, taking gifts, favors, engaging in fraud, or taking advantage um, can all be seen as the opposite of integrity. Also deception, if telling a client that their discharge date is one day because that's what the client wants to hear when their actual discharge date is another, um, that is a lack of integrity there. Also respect of person, uh, respect, dignity, and worth of patients, seeing them as a person, as a human being, uh, rather than seeing them as a label. Also right to privacy, confidentiality and self-determination um, and, and, and to be able to explain to the clients what their rights are. It's important for clients when they come in to know their rights and to be connected to what their rights are. What does this all mean? Can we do anything? Are we not the, uh, the professional? Um, the way to sum this up is is that it's important to understand if there's nothing else that you learn from this class. The one most important thing to learn from an ethics class is don't have sex with your clients. Uh, don't date your clients, don't see your clients outside of the treatment facility, um, and also um, don't uh, become romantically involved with your clients ever, even if it's two years down the road, which we're going to look at Mental Health Texas Code, um, and I have um, the book right here for the Mental Health Texas Code, and I'll be bringing that to class this week, um, but we're going to be looking at that, and we're going to look at what does that mean? Um, you know, two years later, if you are um, at an A meeting and you uh, meet up or see one of your um, former clients, what does this all mean? Basically, um, follow the guidelines that are in place, uh, have your core values, have them out someplace where you can see them. Uh, yes, we can do something. We can do our best to follow these principles in all that we do. <clears throat> we are professionals. Uh, there are a lot of challenges for the work we do working with those who are sick, those who have mental illness, those who <clears throat> do not uh, are in denial, don't know that they have issues. and So there is a lot of responsibility with this. What a research shows is, is it shows a study of master counselors real that five factors were important for ethical and competent counseling. Number one is competence. CEUs, training, education, reading, 
Uh, number two is relational connection, uh, being able to relate to what the clients uh, are going through, being able to uh, study and know the different cultures, the different aspects of where people come from, from poverty to wealth, to be able to be connected to where clients are coming from. Uh, Non-malfeasance or stress, taking mental health days, taking time off, uh, taking care of number one as far as staying mentally healthy yourself. Autonomy, uh, being able to stand alone in decisions and be aware of allowing the clients uh, their autonomy to be where they are. Uh, motivational interviewing does a really good job of this as far as allowing the clients to be where they are and then helping them uh, to grow at their own pace. Uh, through their growth patterns. And then beneficence is, uh, you know, uh, do no harm is uh, malfeasance, but beneficence is uh, look for what you can do to bring out the best in the client. Uh, in most cases, you're going to be doing that uh, automatically and just the service coordination or service presentation. When ethical and uh, guidelines are unclear, mental health workers should rely on their own judgment. Where does judgment come from? It comes from, like I said at the beginning of the, uh, the first lecture in this class, it comes from your own values and beliefs. So how do you find out what your values are? From formal coursework throughout this course, you're going to find out a lot about yourselves and what you believe. Uh, continuing education, you'll do three to six hours of ethics a year for the rest of your career. And then experience uh, guy, the kind of uh, um, guiding yourself through the field will help you uh, to see that. And then do an ethical biography. Find out where you are and uh, where this... Um, you know, where your ethical decisions have gotten you over time, and then review and then correct those as well. Um, okay, we're going to, in class, we will actually work on um, this group project. So that concludes our second lecture in ethics, and I'll see you in class.